Back in 2018, the biggest active underwater eruption ever happened. At least, the one that we could officially record. Scientists followed earthquakes that struck the area in the western Indian Ocean off Madagascar. Between 2018 and 2021, over 11,000 earthquakes struck a small island called Mayan between Madagascar and Mozambique. The strongest one had a magnitude of 5.9. Until then, this area had been pretty peaceful. There had only been two earthquakes recorded over 50 years. Along with regular earthquakes, there were also some unusual seismic humps, like earthquakes at pretty low frequencies forming deep underground. People couldn't feel those hums at the surface, but researchers around the world discovered them and realized they were related to volcanic activity no one actually noticed coming. Something strange happened. That underwater eruption created a giant skyscraper-sized volcano. This new underwater volcano turned out to be around one and a half times the height of One World Trade Center in New York, and almost 10 times bigger than the Statue of Liberty. The area where it appeared had been explored in 2014, but it was almost flat, peaceful, and empty back then. Now, there is an actual volcano nearly 8,500 feet below sea level. The volcano gets its magma from a super-profound reservoir located nearly 34 miles underground. It's the deepest reservoir of volcanic magma that we know about. The Earth has layers, and the middle one is kind of chunky. It's very much like peanut caramel filling many chocolates have. Research shows there are probably hunks of oceanic crust deep inside the Earth's liquid mantle. They're stuck there, creating large lumps in something that was supposed to be a smooth layer. Our planet has a rigid outer layer. It includes a hot upper mantle and cracked crust. The hot mantle moves and churns all the time, making the crust at the surface move too. This way, the oceanic crust dives into the depths and makes huge magma plumes go up toward the planet's surface. Scientists even found an ancient piece of the Pacific Ocean hundreds of miles underneath China. Those are the old remains of the Pacific seabed from long ago, and they were pulled downward below Earth's surface into the mantle transition zone. This rocky slab that used to be at the bottom of the ocean is made of the crust and some solid parts of the upper mantle. Most of the volcanic activity on our planet happens where we don't even see it, under the surface of the ocean. About 70% of all volcanic activity happens in the oceans, and mostly in the area of the South Pacific, with over 1,100 volcanoes squeezed into that area. Coastal cliffs, mountain changes, soils, and sediments that line valleys – these are only a small portion of the rocks on our planet. Oceans hide so much more deep down below the Earth's surface. In between the Earth's surface and its core is the mantle. It's a warm, thick layer of rock that moves and flows constantly. Some hundreds of miles below, there's a place where diamonds grow. As they form, they go through high temperatures and pressure, after which they eventually freeze. That way, when they arrive at the surface, scientists can explore their structure, find out how they formed, and understand better what's going on in the depths of our planet. Thanks to diamonds, they realized the mantle was very wet, and it possibly contained much more water than all the oceans on Earth. Our planet is eating up its own oceans. As its tectonic plates move, dive, and go beneath one another, they drag huge amounts of water into the Earth's interior. The water beneath the surface of our planet can help with developing magma and lubricate faults, which actually makes earthquakes more likely to happen. Water is actually stored in the minerals. It gets incorporated into the planet's crust when new oceanic plates form. They go through the process of bending and cracking as they grind under other plates, and huge amounts of water then go deep into the crust and mantle. Scientists research an area that's 18 miles under the surface. They realize these zones pull 3 billion teragrams, which is more than 2 billion pounds. Any ocean is like a whole new world. There are incredible sceneries below the surface. Magnificent waterfalls, lakes, and rivers. There are thick layers of salt beneath the seafloor, and rivers and lakes form because seawater goes through those layers and dissolves them, creating something that resembles pools. 
the dissolved salt makes the surrounding water denser. That water then settles there, which eventually forms underwater lakes or rivers. But there are also mountain chains, trenches, canyons. There's a canyon in the Bering Sea with more than 8,500 feet of vertical relief. This makes the Grand Canyon look way smaller than it is, since the underwater canyon is nearly 2,500 feet deeper. Deep parts of the ocean are really cold. The temperature of the water can be about 40 degrees, but at the bottom, water can get boiling hot. There are hydrothermal vents in the seafloor. Those are the hot springs located at the edges of tectonic plates. The water they release can reach a temperature of up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. But the pressure at such depths is very intense. So intense, no human being can handle it. Still, it's the pressure that keeps the water from boiling. Ocean depth is on average 2.3 miles. Light waves can still enter at 3,280 feet, even though it's in a very small amount. So all the mysteries hidden below that point remain in total darkness. The actual illuminated part of the ocean goes until 600 feet. Even though the sun gives us light, most of our planet is dark all the time. It's all because of the oceans, covering over 70% of our planet. The loudest sound that came from an ocean, and of the loudest sounds ever recorded, came from an ice quake. It was so loud, researchers picked it up by sensors more than 3,000 miles away. There was a seismic activity that made frozen ground break down. The Antarctic ice sheet is bigger than the continental part of the United States and Mexico together. A big iceberg from Antarctica holds over 20 billion gallons of water, which could make a five-year water supply for a million people. Humans can generally drink sea ice, although we can't drink sea water. As time goes by and the ice ages, the brine trapped between ice crystals drains out. That way, ice becomes fresh enough to consume it. If all the ice sheets and glaciers we have on the Earth melted at the same time, the sea level would rise another 260 feet, which is just a little shorter than the Statue of Liberty, the height of a 26-story building. Clams live long enough to tell us more about ocean's past. Ancient mollusks can live for more than 500 years. To learn more about a tree, you can use its rings to see how old it is. To learn how old a mollusk is, you can examine its rings within the shell and tell. This is also how scientists get information about the ocean, climate, and whatsoever. Clams can help take a look at what happened about a thousand years ago. The Earth doesn't have four, but five oceans now. The new one, called the Southern Ocean, was officially recognized only a few months ago. It borders the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, so scientists couldn't agree if it's really a new ocean or just part of the colder regions of these three. We don't only divide oceans on maps. Each has different conditions for unique marine species. For example, the Southern Ocean has leopard seals, orcas, minke whales, emperor penguins, and other animals that live in cold, icy seas. It's also home to krill, small creatures that look like shrimp and are food for many bigger animals that live there. Life on our planet started about 3.5 billion years ago. I wasn't around then. It's still a mystery how and when exactly, but some theories say life could have first emerged in the depths of the ocean. A few years ago, scientists found microscopic tubes and filaments within rocks formed about 4 billion years ago. These rocks are fragments of ancient oceanic crust. Also, these tiny tubes and filaments are similar to microbes that can still be found on hydrothermal vents in deep parts of the ocean. The idea is these living cells found conditions to stay alive in tiny rocky pores inside the chimneys of those vents and started the amazing adventure of the evolution of life on our planet. The Earth has three main layers, two parts of the core, the dense, hot inner core, and the molten outer core. Then comes the mantle. And then follows the thin crust, the surface that supports life as we know it. At least, that's what we thought. Because now, scientists found a new mysterious layer located deep within the solid inner core. Earth's inner core is approximately two-thirds the size of the moon. And made of nickel and solid iron, it's burning hot. The temperature at the center of our planet 
is the same as at the surface of the Sun. The outer core can reach almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's difficult to explore it because we can't go there. And it's like looking through a really dirty window of 3,200 miles of molten metal and rocks. But we can rely on laboratory experiments on heated pressurized rocks, signals from seismic waves, and computer models. When an earthquake hits, it sends out seismic shock waves. Those waves travel through layers at a different speed, depending on the direction they go and the material they move through. In the new study, a team of scientists set a data set of 100,000 deep earthquakes. Some of them went over 60 miles below the surface. When an earthquake happens on one side of our planet, scientists track its waves all along to the other side. Waves change when they come to the other side, so scientists try to understand the materials these waves have passed through. They found a new layer in the core of our planet thanks to earthquakes. Normally, shock waves travel along the equator, but down below, they digress and go into different directions, about 60 degrees to the side. When waves pass through the inner core going from north to south, they will travel more quickly than waves going through the core parallel to the equator. It's important to understand the core because it creates our magnetic field, which in turn protects the planet from things like solar winds that are charged particles coming from the sun. In the 1960s, we discovered the Earth pulsates every 26 seconds. It's like clockwork, a giant heartbeat. The ground is slightly shaking, but we mostly don't feel it. Researchers can still track it. Some of them think the continental shelf comes as a huge wave break under the oceans. For example, the highest part of the North American continent falls off into a deep abyssal plain. One theory says waves hit this spot, producing regular pulses. It's like having all kinds of drums. You hit them with your hands and accidentally slam that one spot that produces the right harmonic bang to rattle our entire planet. If this theory is true, we're lucky there are no more spots like this that can shake the Earth. Other scientists believe the pulsation happens because there's a volcano near the critical spot, the island of Sao Tome in the Bight of Bonny. You're walking, running, and jumping, but when you stop, it always feels like you're standing still. In reality, you're moving even when you're perfectly still because our planet is always on the move. Depending on where you're at, you could be spinning through the universe at more than 1,000 miles per hour. If you're on the equator, you'll move the fastest. Let's say you have a basketball spinning on your finger. Check the ball's equator. A random point on it has farther to go in just one spin than any point near your finger. That means the point on the equator is moving more quickly. The Earth is a planet that recycles all the time. The ground we're walking on is recycled. Our planet's rock cycle turns rocks of one type into another. That's a cycle that goes on and on. The depths of our planet are filled with magma. As magma is going out onto the surface, it hardens into rock. Tectonic processes like volcanic activity, earthquakes, mountain building, and all of the other processes that shape the surface of our planet bring that rock to the Earth's surface. When the rock is on the surface, erosion shapes it and shaves its bits off. Those small particles then get deposited. All the pressure coming from above compacts the particles into sedimentary rocks, like, for example, sandstone. Sedimentary rocks can also end up deeper and deeper under the Earth's surface. Since there's a lot of heat and pressure, they get cooked into metamorphic rocks. They can go back to the surface once again, or even end up being re-eroded. Sometimes the crust plates are pushing one under another, and this way, rocks can transform into magma once again. We've explored only 5% of the ocean so far. The ocean itself, as well as life below the seafloor, is still a mystery. The sediments that are underlying our oceans are home to different microorganisms that exist even at depths of 1.5 miles beneath the seafloor. There are microbes hidden deep inside volcanic rocks below the seafloor off of the parts of the Pacific, hidden under 870 feet of sediment. 
the biosphere under the seafloor is growing extremely slowly compared to life on the surface. Cell division happens every 10 to 1,000 years. Something's different about the Earth's axis. Climate changes and melting glaciers, mostly in the regions like the Himalayas and Alaska, made the axis shift. Our planet has two kinds of poles. Are the south and north magnetic poles? They affect, they affect things such as drift and navigation. The axis that the Earth is spinning around is another kind of pole. It shifted a little bit over time, but we don't know exactly why. Researchers realize there are moving masses of water, pushing the Earth's axis eastward. Take a basin of water as an example. If you're moving it back and forth, sloshing makes the water move its weight all around. A similar thing is happening on a planetary level. No matter how large an earthquake is, no human could ever feel an earthquake on the opposite side of the Earth, although some people claim they did. In 2013, there was one near the Kuril Islands with a magnitude of 8.5. It went around 400 miles deep. It was so strong, people in Australia reported they could feel the ground shaking. The strongest earthquake happened in Chile in 1960 with a magnitude of 9.5. The rupture zone stretched from 311 miles to almost 620 miles along the country's coast. Earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or higher can't happen. The magnitude depends on the length of the fault where it occurs. The longer the fault, the bigger the earthquake. A fault is a break in a part of the planet's crust. It has rocks on both sides, and they move past each other. We haven't found a fault long enough to generate earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or more. If it happened, it would extend around most of our planet. An earthquake with a magnitude of 12 would require a fault larger than our planet. One side of our planet is getting colder than the other. The Earth has a system that keeps it warm from the inside, a red-hot liquid interior deep below the surface. It spins and, at the same time, generates a magnetic field and gravity. That way, the Earth's core holds the atmosphere closer to the planet's surface. The Earth also absorbs heat from the Sun, mostly on the surface. The heat doesn't spread equally on all parts of the Earth. One side of the planet, the Pacific Hemisphere, is losing heat more quickly than another, the African Hemisphere. This happens because land traps more heat than the surface under the ocean. The seafloor is way thinner than the land mass. Also, the temperature caused by the heat coming from inside the Earth is getting lower because of huge amounts of cold water above it. Clouds are not just like some fluffy distant pieces of cotton. They weigh more than a million pounds and help regulate our planet's temperature. If you take all the water droplets in clouds and bring them to the surface, you could cover the planet with a liquid layer as thin as a human hair. It doesn't seem like a lot, but this water is crucially important for climate. We'd have warmer temperatures if it weren't for the clouds. Oh wow, there's a hole in the bottom of the ocean. It seems that the ocean has a leak, but it's not like a leak you would expect where water is flowing out. It's more like a spring since water is flowing in, not out. This unique leak is something we know as Pythia's oasis. A grad student was the one who accidentally discovered it. He noticed bubbles that were rising to the surface. Normally, bubbles in the ocean tell us there might be some hydrothermal vents, which are hotspots for some pretty cool things. These vents are actually like hot springs on the seafloor, but instead of bubbling with warm water, they release a fluid that has been superheated in the crust of our planet. When seawater seeps into these cracks and travels deep into the crust, it comes into contact with the extremely hot mantle. This heats seawater to very high temperatures, and as it moves back up towards the surface, it carries dissolved gases and minerals. When the hot fluid shoots out of the vents, it mixes with the surrounding seawater and quickly cools down. Just a short distance away from the vent, the temperature can drop to a comfortable 68 degrees Fahrenheit or so, which is, as it seems, exactly what some creatures like. And there are some real weirdos living down there in the darkness, like ghostly fish, 
giant red-tipped tube worms, and a unique type of shrimp with eyes on their back. And some of them, like tube worms and bacteria, rely on the chemicals and minerals released by the vents to survive in harsh conditions. But in this case, the bubbling water didn't come from a hydrothermal vent. It was there because of a spring, and that's a bit more concerning. You see, the water in this reservoir needs to stay where it is. If too much of it seeps out, there could be some serious consequences, especially for the surrounding area. You can see this unusual leak along the Cascadia subduction zone, which is a massive fault line off the Pacific Northwest coast. It's a place where two pretty big plates that make up Earth's crust come together and slide along each other. The water from Pythia's oasis kinda acts as a lubricant between these plates. You can think of the fault zone as an air hockey table. When the fluid pressure is high, it's like you've turned the air on. That means the friction between the plates is reduced, which allows the plates to move. But if the fluid pressure is lower, the two plates can lock together, which then leads to the buildup of stress. Not that they'll feel bad, in the context of tectonic plates, stress is some pressure or force that can cause deformation. And if this stress starts to build up, at some point, it's got to go somewhere. When it's too much, it can trigger earthquakes and most likely not small ones. For example, a release of stress in the Cascadia subduction zone could lead to a magnitude 9 earthquake. For comparison, the biggest earthquake we've ever recorded happened in Chile in 1960 and it had a magnitude of 9.5. The damage was enormous. So we hope the water will stay in its reservoir and keep maintaining the delicate balance between the tectonic plates. We've explored only 5% of the ocean. Who knows how many cool things are there at the bottom, waiting to be found? For example, check out these mysterious holes scientists have stumbled upon in the depths of the Atlantic Ocean, near the Azores. They're neatly aligned and are about 4 inches apart, or in some cases, even several feet. They resemble punctures left by a sewing machine. Some think these holes could have a biological origin. For instance, some fish may have made them while walking along the seafloor. Others believe we could be looking at something that's human-made, maybe left by a spiked tire. Of course, such holes are perfect for making up stories about creatures from other planets who allegedly made them. Or maybe even legendary monsters, like that one from Loch Ness. It's definitely hard to explain such symmetry of the holes, but one deep-sea biologist offered a pretty good explanation. He said there could be an animal burrowing beneath the sediment, and from time to time, it could make little chimneys just to get access to clean water circulation in its small burrow. I mean, there are sediment piles around the opening of each hole, and they do support the idea that something pushed the soil from below. But there's still no proof these holes are actually connected beneath the surface. And there are also a lot of things hidden at the bottom of the oceans and seas that ancient civilizations left us. For instance, archaeologists made a really cool discovery off the southern coast of Croatia a road hidden under layers of sea mud that's 7,000 years old. They found the ancient road at the sunken Neolithic site of Solene. The site of Solene was a human-made island in ancient times, and an archaeologist discovered it two years ago. He was studying satellite images of the area around Korčula, one of the beautiful Croatian islands. When he realized there could be something interesting at the bottom of the sea, he dove into the water with his colleague. And under the surface of the Adriatic Sea, which is part of the Mediterranean Sea, at a depth of 13 to 16 feet, they found stone walls that were most likely part of some ancient settlement. The landmass where people built the settlement was separated from the main island by a narrow stretch of land. Luckily, this area is protected from big waves by the surrounding islands, so the site remained relatively well preserved. It's now hidden beneath the surface of the sea and covered in mud. But it's so exciting to imagine how people walked on that road nearly 7,000 years ago, visiting nearby settlements. If you want to see the weirdest creatures, you can always head to the bottom of the sea. Actually, scientists have determined there could be more than 30 potentially new species at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. They've collected them using their remote-controlled vehicle.
that's a big step because until recently, they could only study such creatures through photographs. I'm talking about segmented worms, different types of coral, some invertebrates similar to centipedes, and many others. But there are also many old freaky creatures that we already know about that look like they came from sci-fi movies. Red octopus, blobfish, okay this one kinda looks normal until you raise it to the surface, the goblin shark, Sloan's viperfish, zombie worms, ugh, yeah I hear ya, let's move on. The seafloor hides things from space too. There are traces of rare forms of plutonium and iron at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. And what's awesome is that all this has come from space. These radioactive materials probably formed during some kind of cataclysmic event in space and eventually made their way out to our beautiful home planet. And this extraterrestrial debris most likely appeared on Earth within the past 10 million years. After it fell to the Pacific Ocean and settled at a depth of almost a mile, it became part of all those layers of rock down there. Plutonium is especially exciting for scientists. I mean, only tiny amounts of it have been found. Hundreds of atoms maybe. But it's still remarkable because these atoms are created by exploding stars. Things like this can help us better understand how the universe produces elements heavier than iron, like plutonium, gold, uranium, and platinum. We're still not sure about the origins of these elements. For a long time, scientists believed that supernovae, which is when a star comes to its end in a fabulous explosion, were responsible for creating these heavy elements. But it seems it's not just that. Some other cosmic events, such as the collision of neutron stars, which are super dense collapsed stars, or some rare types of supernovae, could also be involved. Whoa, let me get my popcorn! Let me take you to a place that seems to be out of this world. Life inside this cave has been isolated from the outside world for about 5.5 million years, and it does show. See for yourself. Due to such a long isolation, the conditions inside the Mobile Cave are like nowhere else on our planet. A unique ecosystem is flourishing there, even though there is a severe lack of sunlight inside the cave, and the air is toxic. The cave, located a few miles west of the Black Sea in Romania, was first discovered in 1986. Nowadays, you can only visit it if you have special permission. Plus, the central caverns are guarded naturally by narrow limestone tunnels and vertical shafts. So, if you're no stranger to claustrophobia, you'd probably better not enter this place. In the depth of the cave, the air has twice less oxygen than the air outside. Instead, it contains a lot of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, so not the freshest air you can breathe. It's also pitch black inside the cavern. But despite, or should I say thanks to, this cocktail of extremely harsh conditions, the site is a true goldmine for biologists. Shockingly, life seems to be booming here. In a 1996 study, scientists identified 48 species, and 33 of them were unique to the cave. Most of the creatures inhabiting the cave are tiny, with long limbs and antennae that help them navigate in the dark. They have no vision and lack pigment, and it makes sense. Why would you need to be able to see if you live in total darkness? And why would you need to be pretty and colorful with no one to see you? Now, I'm going to take you to another cave. It's no less amazing, but looks very different. This is the giant crystal cave, aka the Cave of the Crystals, in Mexico. These ginormous crystals were found in 2000 by a mining company after the water was pumped out of the cave. Two miners then saw the crystals after entering the drying cave on foot. These awe-inspiring crystals are actually massive gypsum pillars hidden 984 feet underground. They're anchored to the walls and the floor of the scorching hot cave. Scientists estimate that the crystals could have been already growing for half a million years. That's why many of them are so long and wide that you can walk across them. Unfortunately, visiting this wonder of nature is impossible at the moment. But maybe it's for the better since the giant crystal cave is a dangerous place that can easily turn into a trap. For tens of thousands of years, it was filled with groundwater, which was originally pushed upward into the opening by a magma chamber located in the depths of our planet. The magma under the cave kept the water hot, but eventually the temperature of the water dipped below 136 degrees Fahrenheit. As a result, 
the water started to fill with calcium and sulfate, whose particles began to recombine into gypsum. And then, white-tinted crystals took over the cave. And since they stayed underwater, they were able to keep growing. You don't have to fly to space to take a closer look at a black hole. Scientists have found something very similar to black holes in the southern Atlantic Ocean. A black hole has such an enormous gravitational pull that once something gets pulled inside, it doesn't have any chance to escape. Even light can't get out of a black hole. But ocean black holes seem to be almost as powerful as their space relatives. But instead of catching the light, they do the same with water. Ocean eddies are massive whirlpools that spin against the main current. They usually swirl billions of tons of water, and most of them are larger than a city. These whirlpools are so powerful that nothing trapped by them can escape. But the scariest thing is that you might not even notice heading into one of them. These things are so huge that you won't spot their boundaries until it's too late. When scientists started exploring ocean vortices with the help of satellites, they discovered the borders of several eddies. After that, they managed to prove that, mathematically, these whirlpools are the same as mysterious black holes in space. Massive eddies are surrounded by super-tight barriers where fluid moves in closed loops. Even water can't get out from the inside of these loops. That's why tight ocean vortices play the role of enormous containers. Water inside them can be totally different from the ocean surrounding an eddy. And I'm not only talking about its temperature. The salt content inside and outside a whirlpool often differs as well. On the thin Curonian spit splitting the Baltic Sea from the Curonian Lagoon, there is one of the most bizarre places on Earth. Locals call this area the Dancing Forest because pine trees in this forest have shockingly unusual shapes. They twist in spirals and circles along the ground. There are some theories why it could be happening, of course. Some people claim that huge amounts of positive and negative energies once clashed in that spot. More down-to-earth individuals believe that the reason is geological. Sandy soil in the area is too unstable to hold trees growing upright. The most popular is the idea that strong winds blowing from the water influence the shape of the trees. In any case, experts haven't come to the final conclusion yet. Look at these underwater crop circles. For the first time, they were spotted in 1995, close to southern Japan's coast. Local divers called these seven feet wide structures mystery circles. The enigma had been plaguing many mines for almost 16 years until the culprit was finally caught. Imagine the researcher's surprise when it turned out to be a male pufferfish. The fish needs a bit more than a week to build one circle, and the aesthetics are obviously crucial. A male is swimming inside the circle, digging valleys in the sand with its fins. But that's not all. The fish also use shells and corals to decorate particular parts of their circles. This whole build a circle thing has a practical purpose as well. The way a male fish swims pushes the sand toward the center of the circle and creates a mound which later serves as a nest. The next mystery on our list is in the Caribbean. Just off the coast of Belize, there's a giant sinkhole. That's the Great Blue Hole. It's about 1,000 feet across and more than 400 feet deep. Once, a long, long time ago, this hole was a cave. But then rising waters filled it, making it collapse in on itself. The deeper you'll descend into the Great Hole's crystalline waters, the darker it will become. You'll see tons of stalactite-filled caves there, but entering them is extremely dangerous, unless you want to get hopelessly lost. Once you reach a depth of 50 feet, you'll notice that the water is shimmering. That's the invisible line dividing the sinkhole's salty top from the freshwater abyss. You might want to turn back right now, who knows what you might come across in the murky depths. There was an old Amazonian legend that told about the river that was so hot that it boiled. And it was believed to be just a legend until Peruvian geoscientist Andres Ruzo questioned if the river could be real. All experts denied such a possibility. After all, hot rivers do exist, but only in the areas where there are volcanoes. As for the part of the country mentioned in the legend, there are no volcanoes in that region. But Andres Ruzo was too dedicated to give up. And in 2011, he finally located the river from the legends. The water in it was indeed steaming hot. Its temperature was 186 degrees Fahrenheit, not boiling, but pretty close to this point. But what shocked the researcher the most was the size of the river. One could think that the almost boiling water was the result of the activity of an underwater hot spring. 
the thermal pools are always small, while the river is 20 feet deep and flows for almost four miles. This is the only river of its kind on our planet. When we think of active volcanoes, one region comes to mind, the Ring of Fire in the Pacific Ocean. Three quarters of Earth's volcanoes sit within this belt. Compare the area to Australia, which doesn't have any volcanic activity. The old continent of Europe is also calm. Or at least, we like to think so. Can you guess what the most active volcano in Europe is? If you thought of Mount Etna on the island of Sicily in Italy, you were right. The volcano has erupted about 200 times and has been far from sleeping in recent decades. The last time this happened was in August 2023. The highest mountain in the Mediterranean is half a billion years old. But in Iceland, there is a much younger volcano. It sprang into action on the 10th of July 2023. In the afternoon, three fissures appeared in the ground on a peninsula in the southwest of the island. This was at a base of a small mountain peak. Its name means Little Ram in the local language. The volcano spewed molten lava high into the air. There were also gas plumes in the area. But the scientific community wasn't surprised by the event. They already knew about the volcanic area that stretches between the cities of Reykjavik and Keflavik. Its name is hard to pronounce. Hey, I want to buy a vowel. It had already erupted during the previous two summers. This activity came after eight centuries of dormancy. In the days leading up to the latest eruption, seismologists, the scientists who study earthquakes, recorded over 12,000 tremors. When the ground opened up in July, the fissures were over a mile and a half long. The following morning, two of them closed. All the lava was now coming out of the last fissure. It grew into an elongated cone the simplest shape of volcano we are all familiar with. The lava soon filled a large crater. It grew almost 100 feet tall during the first week, and it is still growing. On the night when the eruption started, lava spread out in all directions. Its cinders set ablaze the dry moss in the vicinity. Local authorities closed off the surrounding area. There were toxic gases from the volcanoes and smoke from the burning moss. Firefighters flocked to the area. After a week, they proclaimed the area safe. Visitors soon came to witness the birth of Europe's youngest volcano. This form of tourism is quite developed in Iceland. People come from all over the world to watch active volcanoes. The land of fire and ice is home to more than 130 volcanoes. Some 30 of them are active. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. Is volcano tourism safe? In Iceland, it is. The country's authorities research and constantly monitor all of the hotspots. The island is dotted with several dozen seismic stations. These help researchers accurately predict future eruptions. And emergency services are accustomed to these sorts of events. They can quickly cordon off danger zones. This is what happened in 2010. A volcano in the south of the island, the name of which everyone struggled to pronounce, erupted. It spewed out a plume of steam and ash that was 7 miles high. Uh, this wasn't a fun time to be an air traveler. Winds carried the enormous plume southeast toward northern Europe. Many countries closed their airspace for several days for safety reasons. The volcano erupted in March, but the Earth was shaking from January the same year. So seismologists knew that an eruption was approaching. When it comes to the continent's youngest volcano, the tourist infrastructure is already there. Visitors can leave their cars at a designated parking lot. Then they go on a five-hour-long trek. This leads to a viewing deck. Tourists are so close to the epicenter that they can feel the heat haze from the crater. The site is the most impressive at nighttime. Safety is never a concern. Scientists regularly chart out hazard maps that outline the borders of lava fields. This way, visitors who stick by the rules are never in harm's way. More than a week after the eruption started, a section of the crater collapsed. Lava flowed downhill west of the volcano. This majestic smoldering hot river is slow-moving lava. Scientists categorize it as an a-a type. The term is Hawaiian. It describes basaltic lava that has a rough and brittle surface. The flow is composed of broken lava blocks that are called clinkers. They fall off as the substance flows. This reveals red-hot areas. 
The cooler sections of lava are gray and black in color. When it moves forward, it produces a distinctive sound like shattering glass. Nearly a month after the eruption of the new volcano, we got aerial footage of an interesting phenomenon. A tornado formed directly over the lava flow. This occurs due to the high temperatures in the area. When the conditions are right, a column of heated air can easily turn into a mini-tornado. Scientists observed a similar event happen during the 2018 eruption of Mount Kilauea in Hawaii. The lava fields of Europe's second-largest island tell the story of the creation of Iceland. It sits above the place where the North American and Eurasian plates meet each other. Tectonic plates are huge, rocky chunks of Earth's most outer layer. There are roughly 20 of them. They rest on a partially molten layer of rock. All the lava we see on the surface starts its journey here. You could say that these plates float on molten rock. Their boundaries are unstable. So when two plates grind past each other, they release tremendous amounts of energy. The formation of volcanoes is one result. These are places where the molten rock travels upward to the surface. Iceland began to form some 60 million years ago. The tectonic plates under the ocean drifted apart. Enough lava piled up on the surface to create solid ground. This ancient rock is under the waves today. As new lava reaches the surface and cools down, it pushes the old rock away from the center of the island. That's why the oldest parts of Iceland aren't 60, but only 16 million years old. The country's active lava fields are young in geological terms. Some of them are under 1,000 years old. Scientists consider the island a hot spot for volcanoes, pun intended. Nearly a third of the basaltic lava that reaches the Earth's surface in recorded history came from Icelandic eruptions. Fisher swarms, like the ones before the 2023 eruption, cover 30% of the Nordic country. For this reason, only a quarter of the island is inhabited. Norse Vikings were the first people to settle in Iceland at the beginning of the 10th century. Nature threw them a loud welcoming party. Just a few years after their arrival, they witnessed one of the greatest volcanic eruptions in history. Vikings came from a region without volcanoes, so they had no clue as to what was going on. Today, Icelanders are used to such events. This is good because their homeland is entering a new era of volcanic activity. Volcanologists suspect that recent events are an introduction to decades of more frequent eruptions. The peninsula that is home to Earth's youngest volcano is just 17 miles southwest of Iceland's capital city. It's been dormant for a long time. Present-day eruptions there are a reminder that the natural processes that created Iceland are still ongoing. Recently, scientists discovered that there's a historical link between volcanic eruptions in the north of Europe and glaciers. Our planet went through at least five major ice ages. These were exceptionally lengthy periods when the average temperature on Earth dropped. The result was the expansion of ice sheets across northern Europe and North America. The last ice age ended some 10,000 years ago. Researchers are still trying to fully understand how these glacial periods affected volcanic activity. They suspect that the sheer weight of all that ice disrupts the flow of magma underground. When glaciers retreat, the pressure is lifted. This makes it easier for lava to flow upward to the surface where it bursts. Phew! You can finally send that last report for the day and breathe out. The weekend is around the corner, but just when you're about to hit send, you're alarmed by the low rumbling under your desk. Is it the light rail passing by? Unfortunately, that's not the case. It's a volcano speaking. What, here? In Arizona? That's right, the ground keeps shifting under Arizona, reminding us that Earth is alive. No panic though, let's arm ourselves with some context. 20 American states have extinct, active, and dormant, currently sleeping, volcanoes. Among such states, you can find California, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, and Colorado. On the bright side, Arizona's volcanoes are dormant at the moment, but it doesn't mean they won't go off in the near or not so near future. 
Now, how about traveling to Arizona to check the traces of its active volcanic past? They dot the desert landscapes of this state like spots dot a Dalmatian. There are entire volcanic fields southwest of Phoenix, east of Douglas, near Flagstaff, north of Kingman, and near the Mexico border. The most worrying thing about these fields is that even though they're not active at the moment, eruptions in this region might happen every thousand years or so. Well, the time seems to be up. The last powerful and destructive volcanic eruption occurred around 1,000 years ago at the Sunset Crater. Oh, this place is worth paying more attention to. And we will, but a bit later. First, we have to talk about hotspots. No, not that place where you can surf the web. In our volcanic context, a hotspot is a place where insane amounts of heat melt the overlying crust, Earth's thin outer layer, and form volcanoes. This heat rises from the mantle, which is located between our planet's dense, superheated core and the crust. Want to see an example of this type of volcanism? Welcome to the Hawaiian Islands. The Big Island has its active volcanoes because, at the moment, it's situated on top of the Hawaiian hotspot. The older Hawaiian islands were once there too, but later they drifted off towards the northwest. It happened because that's where the oceanic crust on top of which they sat, namely the Pacific Plate, moved. Now, look at the world's ocean basins. Yes, they're literally dotted with islands that sit on top of hotspots, like Hawaii. Iceland, Samoa, the Galapagos, those are probably the most famous examples. But don't think that continents can't host hotspots, they can, but those are far less common. One of the most famous continental hotspots is, ah, I bet you know it, yep, the one beneath the Yellowstone caldera. By the way, the caldera is a vast volcanic crater especially one formed as a result of a massive eruption that led to the collapse of the mouth of a volcano. The Yellowstone hotspot is basically the creator of Old Faithful and the rest of the hot springs and mud pots for which the national park is famous. Speaking of Old Faithful, let's make a small detour and pay more attention to this wonder of nature. It's one of the most well-known geysers in the world. People have been coming from all over the globe to see it for more than a century. The cool thing about this geyser is that the likes of it can only form under very specific conditions. That's why they're pretty rare. Magma under the surface superheats pockets of underground water. The pressure there keeps growing until it eventually pushes the water upward with immense strength. A certain volcanic rock with a high silica content lines the tunnel through which this water escapes. Basically, it creates a unique pipe that can withstand unbelievable pressure and heat created by the water erupting above the ground. Old Faithful was the very first named geyser in Yellowstone. If you come to visit it expecting the thing to erupt every hour on the hour, you're gonna be disappointed. On average, Old Faithful erupts every 91 minutes or so, which isn't that bad either. Plus, you can download a special app which will provide you with the approximate time of the next eruption. But be very careful while visiting and stay away from the site. The water erupting from the powerful geyser reaches 204 degrees Fahrenheit. The steam is even more scorching, up to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. It's hot enough to bake a cake. But let's get back to our volcanic hotspots. Scientists still don't clearly understand why there aren't many hotspot volcanoes on continental crust. One reason might be that the continental crust is much thicker than the oceanic crust, which is about four times as thick on average. Another reason could be that most of Earth's crust, about two-thirds of it, is oceanic. This means that there's less continental crust for hotspots to form under. Now, I bet those of you living in Arizona will appreciate the following info. We'll talk about a volcanic field right in the heart of this state, the San Francisco Volcanic Field. That's a massive area filled with over 600 volcanoes. Yes, they're mostly small, but it doesn't make them any less impressive. 
They're scattered across 1,800 square miles in northern Arizona, a giant territory. Interestingly, scientists are still debating about whether this volcanic field is actually sitting on top of a hotspot. But one thing they agree upon, the volcanoes in this area get younger as you move east. And this pattern matches up with the North American plate moving west over what could be a stationary hotspot beneath the surface of our planet. Cool, huh? The volcanic hullabaloo in that area started around 6 million years ago. So, in geological terms, it's relatively young. As for the most recent eruption, it happened less than a thousand years ago. The Sunset Crater, which I mentioned before, the one near Flagstaff, is the most famous vent from that eruption. The Sinagua people had to leave their homes at Wupatki Pueblo because of the eruption. That site is now part of the Wupatki National Monument. There, you can see how people lived in this volcanic region many years ago. If you go to explore this area, you'll notice that most of the volcanoes there are basalt cinder cones, small and steep. The Colorado Plateau has quite dry weather conditions. That's why the volcanoes haven't worn down much. Some of the best examples of those cones, like this one, called the SP Crater, still look like they appeared yesterday. But look around. It's not just cinder cones. The San Francisco volcanic field also has a stratovolcano, as well as some lava domes that formed from volcanic rocks with more silica than basalt you can find in places like Hawaii. It means they're thicker and don't flow as easily. Anyway, the Strata Volcano is going to be one of the most epic sites you'll come across while exploring this volcanic field. Well, not the Strata Volcano itself, but the San Francisco Peaks, the remains of that giant formation. They stand tall at more than 12,600 feet. That's four and a half Burj Khalifas placed on top of one another. It makes the peaks some of the biggest landmarks in northern Arizona. They're not only stunning, but also sacred to the Native American people who have lived in the area for many generations. Now, unlike those super active volcanoes in Hawaii, the San Francisco volcanic field takes its time, thousands of years between eruptions. But you shouldn't relax just yet. Geologists say another eruption is likely to happen one day. It will probably occur in the remote eastern part of the field, away from big towns. Phew! And if that next eruption is anything like the one that formed Sunset Crater, it would be quite the show. Lava fountains and rivers of lava flowing. At the same time, the next eruption might not happen for centuries, maybe even millennia. Until then, the San Francisco volcanic field will remain a hidden gem of volcanic history, waiting for its next fiery performance. So, you might have heard that Yellowstone National Park is sitting on top of a giant supervolcano. That's the reason why the area can boast powerful geysers and hot springs. But it also means that underneath Yellowstone, there is an enormous magma chamber. In 2015, researchers from the University of Utah found out that this chamber was much bigger than everyone had previously thought. They even found one more reservoir with magma under the top one. Apparently, the more spacious the chambers are, the more magma they contain. Together, the two reservoirs store a glob of magma that could easily fill the Grand Canyon not once, but 11 times. But you know the most worrying thing about the magma chambers? They tend to push against the ground above them. As a result, the land in Yellowstone rises about 1 to 2 inches a year. On top of that, Yellowstone has the status of an active volcano and its volcanic explosivity index, yes, there is one, is 8 out of 8. Such a high number means that if this volcano erupted, it would be an apocalyptic event. To put it into perspective, the eruption of Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, which is considered the most powerful in living memory, was given a mere 6 on the volcanic explosivity index. Ha! Loser! Now, let's figure out if there's anything to worry about. In March 2023, the University of Utah seismograph stations 
recorded 354 earthquakes in the entire region of Yellowstone National Park. Sounds like a lot. But keep in mind that the most impressive event of the month was a mini-earthquake of magnitude 3.7. It was part of a swarm of 106 earthquakes that began on March 29th and continued until the end of the month. Yep, earthquakes apparently also come in swarms, so be aware. Experts say that Yellowstone's seismic activity is, well, kind of more active than usual. But it's really nothing serious. A geophysicist working at Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, called Michael Poland, claims that the volcano won't erupt anytime soon. For this to happen, there must be enough magma ready to erupt beneath the surface. Whew. There should also be enough pressure to cause this magma to rise. But neither of these conditions exist today. According to the expert, Yellowstone is stable now. At the same time, Poland and his team are keeping track of all kinds of underground activity, looking for warning signs of possible eruptions. Some of them can be the frequency of earthquakes and ground deformation. Thousands of mini earthquakes, coupled with extreme changes in the surface of the ground in that area, can be alarming. The team also monitors the temperature of the park's thermal features. That's another noteworthy sign of a potential disaster park wide changes in geyser activity, as well as gas and thermal emissions. So, despite the media claims that Yellowstone is due to erupt soon because the last eruption happened 70,000 years ago, that's not how volcanoes work. Experts say that it's one of the most popular misconceptions about volcanoes. They don't follow timelines. If a super eruption did happen, though, the most worrying thing for us would not be the lava flows, and not an earthquake that would most likely accompany the natural disaster. No, the worst consequence of such a super eruption would be ash and ash fall. Let's have a look at what it was like when the Yellowstone volcano erupted many years ago. There have been at least three super eruptions in the history of the volcano. The most powerful of them was 2,500 times more devastating than the terrifying eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State in 1980. As for the most recent super eruption, it was dubbed the Lava Creek eruption. It formed the Yellowstone caldera after spewing out an insane amount of dust, volcanic ash, and rock into the air. Recently, scientists have also learned about two other previously unknown super eruptions that happened around 9 and 8.7 million years ago. The younger of the two is now considered to be the largest recorded event of the whole Snake River Yellowstone volcanic province. Anyway, let's have a look at what was going on all those millions of years ago. Because I wasn't around then, so we're all assuming this stuff based on evidence. The first signs of the disaster appeared long before the catastrophe broke out. For thousands of years, the heat had been welling up from within the planet's insides. It had been melting rock beneath the planet's crust and leaving behind huge chambers. They were filled with a pressurized mixture of semi-solid rock, magma, water vapor, and different gases, including carbon dioxide. All this scorching underground soup was expanding since more and more magma arrived with time. The land over the volcanic system was rising upward almost unnoticeably. A year before the super eruption, Yellowstone gave a warning. A burp, maybe? But that long ago, there was no one who could interpret these signals. Plus, those alarming processes were mostly going on underground. For example, decompression releases gas bubbles. While bursting, such bubbles can often power particular kinds of eruptions. Months before the eruption, small-scale earthquakes became more frequent and more intense. The ground in many spots all over the supervolcano got hotter than it used to be. Surface lakes and groundwater also became warmer. If people had been around at that time, they would have noticed unusual steam fogging in that area. Not long before the eruption started, the growing pressure pushed the ground over the magma chamber up. This created a dome-shaped uplift. Narrow cracks started to open along the edges of this dome. Imagine opening a bottle of soda after you've shaken it. Something like that was happening near the volcano. 
Eh, think Mentos and Diet Coke. The pressure was released through the fractures when gases were bursting out from under the surface. So right before the disaster, the ground around the Yellowstone volcano lifted. Geothermal pools and geysers heated up to boiling temperatures and got more acidic than usual. The magma started to rise toward the surface. At one point, the rock roof of the magma chamber couldn't resist anymore, and the eruption kicked off. Small but constant tremors began to move the ground days before the catastrophe. But the real shaking didn't start until several minutes before the eruption. With a deafening roar, a massive column of lava and ash curled up into the air. Within several minutes, a pyroclastic flow rushed across the area at a hurricane force speed. Such a flow is a liquid mixture of half-solid lava pieces, volcanic ash, and hot expanding gases. It looked like an extremely hot toxic snow avalanche. With a temperature of about 1300 degrees, it was burning everything in its path. The volcano kept pumping ash for days on end. For all living creatures, ash fallout was one of the most dangerous consequences of the eruption. Volcanic ash turns into glassy cement within seconds of being inhaled. Most animals didn't have a chance to survive. Even thick trees started to collapse under the weight of this dense substance. It only took a couple of days until a thick layer of ash covered huge territories. After the ash got into the stratosphere, the temperatures all over the world started to drop. The eruption was rich in sulfur, which is an effective sunblocker. That's why it soon got so cold that there was no summer in the whole world for the next several years. Animals couldn't find food and clean water. This natural disaster called the Gray's Landing Super Eruption was colossal. That's how researchers described it in their recent studies. It affected a huge territory. The streams of lava enameled an area as large as New Jersey in scorching hot volcanic glass. It instantly sterilized the land surface, wiping out all the plant life that had been thriving there before. Now, if such an eruption were to happen these days, it would cover Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming with almost three feet of toxic volcanic ash. Many regions would be plunged into darkness. Even the coast, where most Americans live, would experience problems with the spread of the ash cloud. It would destroy crops and contaminate pastures, ruin power lines and electrical transformers. Well, so I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's a good thing that such a disaster isn't expected to occur anytime soon. Hey, we got enough other stuff on our plate. If all the volcanoes on Earth suddenly erupted together, it'd be loud. <laughs> We'd also have around 1,500 of these formations bursting at once. Now, normally it's just 10 to 20 volcanoes that are active each day. But what would the world look like if they all blew their tops simultaneously? Geologists think it wouldn't be pretty. Even if only the land volcanoes erupted together, it would set off a chain reaction way worse than anything we've ever seen before. The two big problems would be ash and volcanic gases. While the explosions in lava would be damaging for people nearby, the real danger lies in what happens next. A thick layer of ash would cover the planet, blocking out sunlight completely. No sunlight means no photosynthesis, which means crops would fade away and temperatures would drop considerably. And all this ash cloud could remain in our atmosphere for up to 10 years. Now, ash aside, there's also acid rain to worry about. Volcanic gases like hydrochloric acid and sulfur dioxide would mix with the atmosphere and fall back down as acid rain. This type of weather would harm the groundwater and ocean surfaces. Even if humans would find a way to survive up to this point, we'd have no corals and no other sea creatures around. Scientists have seen similar events in Earth's history at a smaller scale. Big volcanic eruptions have been linked to mass extinctions. When Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991, it cooled parts of the world for two years. But the extra carbon dioxide from these eruptions could also heat the planet, the same way we turn our stoves to broil for that extra crispy layer on our casserole. Mm. Geologists also mentioned that there's evidence in our atmosphere that stuff like this may have happened in the distant past. During the Cretaceous period, 
carbon dioxide levels were way higher than today, which made it difficult for marine life to thrive. Who would survive all this? Probably just some extremophiles, these organisms that survive in harsh conditions like hot springs or deep undersea vents. As for humans, we could all lay low in underground bunkers until things clear up. Or build multiple space stations that could fit us all. Yeah, right. The chances of all volcanoes erupting at once, though, are very slim. Whew. That's because there isn't one giant source supplying all the volcanoes on Earth. Each one of these openings has its own deposit of magma, except for a few cases where they indeed share the supply. For example, in 1912, Nova Rupta in Alaska erupted alongside another volcano, sharing magma. Scientists have also found evidence of magma hiding under volcanic areas, like under the Taupau Volcanic Zone in New Zealand. This magma can spread out horizontally for long distances, but it's still just a local feature. Even if we consider all the magma under Taupau as one system, it's not connected to other volcanic areas like Indonesia or the Philippines. Because the great majority are isolated, volcanoes can't sink up to erupt at once. The magma comes from different processes, like mantle decompression or adding water to the mantle through subduction. There's no way to make all these different volcanoes erupt together because of how tectonics work. Now, that doesn't mean we won't see interesting volcano activity in the future. Take an underwater area near British Columbia, where recently, about 200 small earthquakes per hour have been noted. Deep beneath the Pacific Ocean floor, off the coast of Vancouver Island, magma is set to erupt, heating the water so much that it'll bubble like soda. However, this event will likely go unnoticed by anyone other than scientists. The anticipated eruption will most likely happen around 3 miles below the ocean surface. Scientists explain that the earthquakes range from negative to 4.1 magnitude, meaning only those nearby would feel any tremors. This unusual activity gives us a rare opportunity to study how the Earth's crust forms. The magma beneath the ocean floor is estimated to be almost 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, but will cool rapidly upon eruption and contact with water. This runny rock will solidify upon contact with the seafloor, turning black quickly. This event will be useful for biologists, too, who will have the opportunity to study the marine animal's response to any changes, like run! Antarctica, often seen as a vast icy continent, also holds a volcanic surprise beneath its frozen surface. Researchers have identified over 130 under the western ice sheet alone making it the largest volcanic region on Earth. Most of these volcanoes, about 90, were only recently discovered in 2017. But could any of these Antarctic volcanoes actually erupt? Well, it depends on which volcano we're talking about. While these formations are relatively young in geologic terms, it's hard for scientists to tell if they're still active or not. There are only two confirmed active volcanoes in Antarctica, Deception Island and Mount Erebus. The latter, standing tall as the highest peak on the continent, has been continuously erupting since at least 1972. It's known for emitting gas and steam, and sometimes even throwing out rocks in what are called Strombolian eruptions. One of its most notable features is a persistent lava lake in its crater, a rare phenomenon due to specific conditions needed to keep the surface molten. For instance, it's fueled by a steady supply of magma from deep within the Earth's mantle. This continuous inflow of molten rock provides the material for the lava lake to exist. It also features low ambient temperatures. Despite its location in Antarctica, Erebus has relatively mild temperatures in its summit region because of the heat generated by the volcanic activity. This allows the lava lake to remain liquid rather than freezing over. Deception Island, another active volcano, last erupted in the 70s. While it's currently not showing signs of imminent eruption, it's being monitored closely for any concerning activity. Apart from these two being confirmed to be active, Antarctica is dotted with fumaroles, openings in the Earth's crust that release gases and vapors. Sometimes these fumaroles can create icy towers reaching heights of 10 feet. What we should focus on is maybe supervolcanoes. They're this type that has the potential to produce the most massive and destructive eruptions. 
Unlike the typical one, which has a single vent, supervolcanoes have a vast magma chamber beneath the surface, spanning tens or even hundreds of miles in diameter. Their eruptions can have catastrophic effects on the surrounding area and even impact global climate patterns because of the amounts of ash and gases they spill out into the atmosphere. One famous supervolcano is the Yellowstone one, which some say is gearing up for another eruption. It has the capacity to unleash a colossal eruption, spewing over 240 cubic miles of material. As much as we'd like to predict its behavior, volcanoes don't stick to a calendar. Hmm. On the contrary, eruptions simply happen when there's enough magma beneath the surface. There also needs to be enough pressure for the magma to travel upwards. As far as we can measure, these conditions are not currently met at Yellowstone. Sure, many volcanoes operate on a cyclical pattern, but that doesn't mean Yellowstone is overdue. In fact, Yellowstone has had just three major eruptions over the past 2.1 million years. Also, the term supervolcano refers to the formation's size, not necessarily how fussy it is. Yellowstone's monitoring is extensive, tracking seismicity, ground deformation, thermal emissions, gas, water chemistry, and surface changes. Signs of an eruption would include thousands of earthquakes over a short period. We'd also see deformation on the ground and weird gas emissions ahead of time. Stable as it might look like for now, the consequences of it having a major eruption could look ugly. Ash dispersion could blanket a 500-mile radius, potentially disrupting Midwest agriculture and clogging waterways. Ash and gas emissions into the stratosphere could induce global climactic effects, making our planet colder for several years. And yes, we've seen some research that it shows there's more liquid molten rock under the Yellowstone volcano than scientists believe. But that doesn't translate to imminent danger. The largest volcanic region on Earth is not in Africa or Japan, but under the ice of Antarctica. Scientists found 138 volcanoes in its western part, and if they decide to go wild, you'll surely notice it. They could melt huge amounts of ice that will move into the ocean, raise its level, and make our planet uninhabitable for humans. But before you pack your things to fly away to another planet, hear me out. Only two of the Antarctic volcanoes are officially classified as active now. And it would take a whole series of eruptions, decade after decade, to seriously impact the whole world. Mount Erebus, one of the two Antarctic volcanoes currently in action, proudly bears the title of the world's southernmost active one. It has been continuously erupting since at least 1972. It emits plumes of gas and steam and sometimes even spews out rocks. And scientists call it Strombolian eruptions. One of the coolest features is a lava lake in one of its summit craters, with molten material on the surface. Such lakes are rather rare because they need certain conditions to make sure the surface never freezes over. The second active volcano is Deception Island, a horseshoe-shaped landmass. It is the caldera of an active volcano that last erupted over 50 years ago. Scientists who monitor it say it shouldn't go wild anytime soon. Antarctica also has plenty of fumaroles. Those are volcanic vents that release gases and vapors into the air. In the right conditions, they can spew out enough stuff to build fumarolic ice towers up to 10 feet tall. Scientists keep an eye on the Antarctic volcanoes with seismometers that detect when the Earth starts trembling from volcanic activity. Sometimes they also use more complicated tech, but it's all really challenging because of how far away this polar region is and how tricky it is to get there. That's why no one can predict when one of the continent's volcanoes that are now sleeping might erupt. We can guess what this waking up would look like if we analyze the events from nearly 20,000 years ago. So, shall we? One of Antarctica's sleeping volcanoes, Mount Takahe, had a series of eruptions and spewed out a good amount of halogens rich in ozone back then. Some scientists say these events warmed up the southern hemisphere. Glaciers started to melt and helped finish the last ice age. For these events to repeat, we'd need a series of eruptions with substances rich in halogens from one or more volcanoes that are now above the ice. It's an unlikely scenario, but since it already happened in the past, it's not completely impossible. 
As for volcanoes hiding under a thick layer of ice, it looks like their gases would hardly make it to the atmosphere. But they would be strong enough to melt huge caverns in the base of the ice and produce a serious amount of meltwater. The West Antarctic ice sheet is wet and not frozen to its bed, so this meltwater would work as a lubricant and set the overlying ice into motion soon. The volume of water that even a large volcano would generate in this way is nothing compared to the volume of ice beneath it. So a single eruption wouldn't make a difference. But several volcanoes erupting close to or beneath any of the western Antarctica's big ice streams would. Those ice streams are rivers of ice that take most of the frozen water in Antarctica into the ocean. If they change their speed and bring unusual amounts of water into the ocean, its level will rise. As the ice would get thinner and thinner, there would be more and more new eruptions. Scientists call it a runaway effect. Something like that happened in Iceland. The number of volcanic eruptions went up when glaciers started to recede at the end of the last ice age. So it looks like, for massive changes, several powerful volcanoes above the ice with gases full of halogens need to get active within a few decades of each other and stay strong over many tens to hundreds of years. Antarctica stores around 80% of all the fresh water in the world, and if they melted all of it, global sea levels would rise by almost 200 feet. And then we'd have to look for a new planet to live on. But this again is an unlikely scenario. It's more likely that the eruptions under the ice will lubricate ice streams and seep water into the ocean. But it wouldn't be the end of the world. A super strong, super angry supervolcano could do it, though. And it has already happened in the past. Over 200 million years ago, the world went through a major makeover with not one, not two, but four massive volcanic eruptions and huge pulses. The supervolcano called Camp had been erupting over and over for 600,000 years. It all happened in Rangelia, a large chunk of land that used to be a supermassive volcano stretching across what's now British Columbia and Alaska. And it wasn't the lava or the volcanic ash that ruined the environment. The eruption made carbon levels skyrocket. The planet would never be the same again. This volcanic activity might have helped dinosaurs grow from cat-sized critters into giants we saw in Jurassic Park. It kicked off a 2 million year rainy season. It made the whole world hot and humid. And the dinos just loved it. Researchers dug deep into sediment layers beneath an ancient lake in Asia to uncover these secrets. They found traces of volcanic ash and mercury, clear signs of those epic eruptions. There were carbon signatures showing huge spikes in carbon dioxide levels. It made the atmosphere toasty, and the rain poured down. So the bad news is, another eruption like this could happen. The supervolcano beneath Yellowstone National Park has been sleeping for nearly 70,000 years. But if it wakes up, it would be many times more catastrophic than the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980. It's considered the most disastrous volcanic eruption in U.S. history. It followed two months of earthquakes and injection of magma below the volcano that weakened and destroyed the entire north face of the mountain. The eruption column went 80,000 feet into the atmosphere and spread ash over 11 U.S. states and several Canadian provinces. The last Yellowstone eruption was a thousand times greater than that. The ground above Yellowstone sits on a hot spot made of molten and semi-molten rock called magma. This magma stuff flows into a chamber beneath the park, about 4 to 6 miles down, making the ground puff up like a balloon. But then, as it cools down, the ground goes back to its usual state. Volcano watchers have been keeping an eye on this for a century. They noticed the ground lift up about 10 inches around 20 years ago. But since 2010, it's been going back down. The experts say we have no big eruptions on the horizon, so doomsday isn't coming anytime soon. But there's some underground activity going on lately which keeps us interested. Since humans haven't been around to witness every little thing Yellowstone does, it's kind of tough to say for sure what's brewing down there. Yellowstone has had some epic eruptions within the last couple million years. They happen like clockwork, with gaps of six to 800,000 years between them. The last big one was around 640,000 years ago, and it basically reshaped the entire landscape, spreading ash and debris as far as Louisiana. 
You can still see the aftermath of the last big eruption in the Yellowstone caldera today. Experts say a massive eruption, like the last one, is an unlikely scenario. We're more likely to see eruptions of steam and hot water or lava flows. When and with what force it will wake up remains a mystery to scientists. The latest super-eruption of Yellowstone occurred 640,000 years ago, and it was long before Homo sapiens saw the light of day. But we were around during another, no less devastating natural disaster. This super-eruption took place on the island of Sumatra around 74,000 years ago. That's when an erupting supervolcano wreaked havoc on huge territories, sending up plumes of debris and ash that spread for thousands of miles and caused temperatures on the planet to plummet. The effects of this super-eruption were visible as far away as southern Africa. Experts believe they could have impacted early humans there. By the time the volcano erupted, our ancestors had already been using stone tools and had likely known how to produce yarn. And some specialists even think that the Toba super eruption was so powerful it could push our ancestors to the brink of extinction. They claim that Toba might be the largest volcanic eruption to occur on Earth within the last two million years. The eruption disgorged so much pyroclastic rock it would be enough to cover the entire United States to the depth of a one-story house. About a third of that deposit piled up on northern Sumatra, while a lot more ended up beneath the floor of the Indian Ocean. The super-eruption left an elliptical crater lake around 60 miles long. The caldera is so large it's hard to feel that you're indeed in a volcano. Pumice deposits from the eruption remain in the canyon walls and go deep below the ground. There aren't many arguments about the amount of pumice and ash involved in this disaster. At the same time, experts aren't sure how much sulfur ended up in the atmosphere. Even some sulfur layers in the polar ice could be potential candidates. But so far, scientists haven't found any connection between them and Toba. But let's get back to the dramatic impact the super-eruption had on early humans. It turns out, some not only survived, but even thrived after this natural catastrophe at least judging by the artifacts they made during and after the eruption. The disaster might not have posed a serious threat to those of our ancestors who took refuge along the coast. Genetic evidence hints that modern humans descend from a few thousand people that ventured out of Africa around 60,000 years ago. Why just a few thousand? According to some experts, the rest of our ancestors could have been devastated by the Toba eruption. After all, the supervolcano spewed out a thousand cubic miles of dust and rock in a flash, leaving a scar in the ground that was dozens of miles wide. All that dust and sulfur Toba sent into the atmosphere potentially cooled the surface of our planet, which led to the appearance of glaciers and the lowering of Earth's sea levels. And since Toba might have had an important role in shaping humankind, scientists have been working hard trying to understand precisely how early humans reacted to this disaster. In 2011, several researchers found an enigmatic soil sample in South Africa's Pinnacle Point, an archaeological site overlooking the Indian Ocean. This sample contained some volcanic ash. After examining the layer, they found more than 400,000 artifacts left by early humans. Those ranged from heat-treated stone tools to signs of fire and animal bones. Based on this finding, the team suggested that early humans on the South African coast thrived after the eruption, living in that area for thousands of years and improving their tools. The region might have served as a refuge during and after the Toba eruption. A 2009 study suggested that the eruption could have lowered global temperatures by 14 degrees Fahrenheit. It would have made survival tough elsewhere in Africa. If there had been a volcanic winter, it wouldn't have been as cold along the coastline. On the other hand, newer studies claim that Toba spewed out so much sulfur into the atmosphere that the resulting aerosols could have stuck together, which would have limited their cooling effect in the long term. In other words, right after the eruption, temperatures would have plummeted, but only in some regions. 
and after three years or so, the effects of the eruptions would have calmed down altogether, becoming not dangerous to humans. Well, apparently, more research is needed. Meanwhile, let's figure out if we should watch out for any volcanoes these days. Last year, thousands of small earthquakes shook the ground near Iceland's Svartsengi geothermal power plant. Magma rose to the surface there, and now it has opened wide fractures slicing through the small town of Grindavik. The ground there is still swelling, and an eruption might happen with little notice. But of course, that's not all. Over the planet, 45 other volcanoes keep rumbling. For example, Italy's Vesuvius, that infamous thing that finished the city of Pompeii in 79 CE. Over the last 17,000 years, the volcano has experienced eight explosive eruptions, followed by powerful pyroclastic flows. Dense masses of super hot ash, lava fragments, and gases flowing at high speeds. The volcano's last eruption happened in 1944. Mount Rainier is one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the USA. Its high elevation, chemical composition, and proximity to Washington, Seattle, and Tacoma suburbs, and the volcano's ability to produce massive pyroclastic flows make Mount Rainier a threat to consider. The heat from this volcano could potentially melt the ice and snow covering it, leading to rapid downstream flows of debris, mud, and rocks. The Novarupta volcano in Alaska's Katmai National Park and Reserve formed in a 1912 eruption, which was the world's largest in the 20th century. The volcano sent almost 7 cubic miles of ash and debris into the air. It also produced such a powerful ash flow that it created the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. Mount Pinatubo is located in a populated region in the Philippines. It became notorious after a 1991 massive eruption, which was the second largest eruption of the 20th century. More than 700 people lost their lives during that natural disaster. Today, more than 21 million people live within 62 miles of Pinatubo. Mount Agun, a continuously erupting volcano in Indonesia, had its last major eruption in 1963. It was one of the most tragic eruptions in the country's history. It lasted for 11 months, producing ashfall and pyroclastic flows that led to the loss of more than 1,000 lives and serious property damage. People saw ash plumes above the volcano throughout 2018, following the eruption in November 2017. Japan's Mount Fuji hasn't erupted since 1707. That year, a massive earthquake likely set it off. In 2014, experts warned that Fuji could be at risk of another eruption following the nine-magnitude earthquake that shook Japan in 2011. Experts believed the earthquake had raised pressure below Fuji. The eruption in 1707 sent so much ash and debris into the air that all this mass even reached Tokyo. Should Fuji erupt again, it would affect more than 25 million people in the surrounding areas. The eruption of Washington's Mount St. Helen in 1980 was one of the most destructive volcanic events in U.S. history. 57 people, as well as thousands of animals, lost their lives during that natural disaster. The eruption also destroyed around 200 square miles of forest. Experts think that Mount St. Helens' history of massive eruptions means that future catastrophes are bound to happen. The next explosive eruption might send large amounts of ash all over the Pacific Northwest. No wonder the volcano is under close monitoring. One of Indonesia's most active volcanoes, Mount Merapi, has been erupting for centuries. NASA claims that the biggest risk of this volcano is pyroclastic flows which can spread over vast areas and harm loads of people. For the last time, Merapi erupted in January 2024, sending plumes of smoke into the air. These days, more than 24 million people live in the area surrounding this volcano. The ground shakes beneath you. The pictures rattle on the walls. You hear a rumble off in the distance. Then, boom, a deafening explosion. 
The shockwave blasts through the windows and sets off car alarms. You duck under the dining table for cover, but then you remember you live not far from a supervolcano in the middle of a tropical jungle. So staying in one place isn't a good idea. The shaking finally halts. You take this chance to peek outside and see a giant cloud of smoke covering the sky. It's lunchtime, but you wouldn't know it. The sun is completely veiled and darkness falls. The power's out in the whole city. In this darkness, you see red molten lava shooting from the sky and spilling on the rim. You run outside along with dozens of your neighbors. Your priority right now? Find safe shelter and fast. You think about taking the car, but with Mm. everyone running on the road, that's a no-go. So you run on foot where the crowd is going. Super volcanoes are in a league of their own when it comes to natural disasters. Surprisingly, it's not all about size or height. A volcano is dubbed super if it erupts more than 240 cubic miles of magma. That's more than enough to overfill Lake Erie. It must also have a history of erupting and a magnitude of 8 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. The largest active volcano on Earth is Hawaii's Mauna Loa. It's so big, it would cover the entire state of Rhode Island plus some. And next time you see a commercial plane flying high in the sky, remember that 30,000-some-foot altitude is about as tall as Mauna Loa is from base to summit. It's technically taller than Everest when you measure it like that, yet it's not considered a supervolcano. So you're running along the dark road not knowing and barely seeing where to go. Then, all of a sudden, a massive flaming boulder smashes through the bridge in front of you. You and everyone else are now stranded on the side of the volcano, as it's getting more chaotic each second. Most of the crowd disperses, finding their own ways to safety. You remember there's a way to the other side not many people know about. But you'll have to cross a raging river through the dense jungle. You calm what's left of the crowd, and everyone follows you to your secret getaway. You finally get out of the city limits and head into the jungle. With the sky already dark, the tall trees and thick leaves make it almost pitch black. Everyone gets out their phone flashlights to navigate through the dark path. You all need to stick together and make sure nobody gets lost. Suddenly, fiery rocks strike the trees not far from you. Everyone jolts and tries to rush ahead. But nowhere is safe when it's raining scalding fire all around. You and your group have to pick up the pace or else. Imagine a typical avalanche or mudslide. Very dangerous situations on their own. Now, imagine an avalanche of lava rocks and lava sliding down a mountain instead of mud. That's what's making its way towards you right now. More and more people catch up with your group and bring news that the entire neighborhood is submerged in lava. It's traveling quicker than you thought. You can never really predict how fast a lava flow will be until you see it. It all depends on how thick it is and how steep the mountain slope. Lava can move slowly at about 20 feet a minute, a fraction of the average person's walking speed. Or it can flow as fast as 30 miles per hour, which even the fastest person on Earth can't outrun. But the lava isn't even the most dangerous problem. If you didn't have protection, the gases spewing from the eruption would fill your lungs, and those spread faster and further than the lava flow. Your eyes and throat would be itchy. You'd get a headache, dizziness, increased heart rate, difficulty breathing. The worst would be passing out from the lack of oxygen. Luckily, everyone managed to grab their gas masks before leaving their homes. You're now entering the treacherous terrain of the jungle and the danger zone. Everyone's phone batteries are giving out one by one, so your vision is even more limited. The terrain is tougher, and you can't hear any sounds from the river. At this point, you're not even sure if you're going the right way. But your instincts tell you the deeper you go, the safer you'll be. The path is muddy, and the vines are hindering everyone's movements. That's when you hear something big running through the jungle. It's coming up on you fast. You can't see a thing until it's right up on you. A bear. And there goes a rhino. Wild cats, domestic cats, dogs, different creatures of all sizes and species. They all come running through the jungle right past you. You and your fellow humans aren't the only ones fleeing from the eruption. The rumbling is still going on. Before you know it, a shower of fire rocks strikes right behind you and ignites parts of the jungle. There's no going back. Everyone picks up and runs for it. You hear thunder in the distance. A flash of lightning lights up the dark sky. 
you think, finally, some rain to wash away this fiery nightmare. But that's not a regular storm brewing. These giant smoke clouds can mimic a thunderstorm under similar conditions. Your luck finally pays off. You hear the river straight ahead. You reach the bank and have to hop on some stones to get to the other side. You almost slip when someone from the group catches you just in time. Whew, that was too close. Not far down the river is a large waterfall leading straight to a shallow lake with sharp rocks at the bottom. The ash from the lava falls like snow, covering most of the trees and landing on the river. Ash is one of the most dangerous things about volcanic eruptions. You're soaked to the bone, but it's a lot better than ash and smoke. And then the rest of the group follow. The next thing you know, the river starts steaming as lava meets the bank and runs into the water. You try your best to speed things up. The lava can heat this water up to dangerous levels, and there are still people slowly crossing the river on the slippery rocks. Luckily, you manage to get everyone across. Well, almost everyone. You turn around and see someone's leg got caught between two rocks. The lava continues to pour into the river. You can feel the heat of the steam. You rush back to this person and try to pull them out. Their leg won't budge. Someone else from the group comes to help, and you're finally able to pull them out in the nick of time. You and everyone else, now exhausted from your trek, keep going as far as possible. That's when you see the main road that connects you to the broken bridge. There are others on the road that got out safely, and even some cars filling up with survivors and heading fast out of the area. The volcano is still spewing lava, and the entire city is flooded with it. What was once your town now looks like a giant burning lake. Planes and helicopters can't fly because of the smoke and ash, so don't count on an air rescue. You're still at risk even though you're on safer ground, so it's still too early to celebrate. Everyone continues to move away from the city. The further, the better. The ground continues to shake, but this time it's even more intense than before. Supervolcanoes are powerful enough to cause many earthquakes. But it's a good thing you're out in the open, far from the buildings and debris in the city. Now, back to reality. Rest assured that a volcanic eruption of this intensity won't happen for a very long time, as in millions of years. Besides, thanks to warning systems and humanity's preparation for such an event, it's extremely rare for even a regular volcano to do as much damage as it could. So don't scratch Yellowstone off your travel list just yet.